I'm a mother of two daughters and live out in the country. My husband is a welder and a really outgoing and charismatic guy, which means that he has tons of friends that will periodically stop by to hang out with him. In fact, there are some friends he trusts enough to use the tools in his garage and stay at the house when he isn't home. Well, one late afternoon, he was gone when I heard someone pull into the driveway. We have two dogs who were going nuts with barking at the picture window in our living room. I looked down and I saw a familiar blue blazer and assumed my husband's friend, Bob, was over to use something from the garage or wait for my husband to get home. He hadn't knocked on the door, so I figured they'd already talked to each other about it. No big deal. But the dogs? They would not stop barking and growling, which just didn't seem right because they knew Bob. So I looked more closely out the window and realized that there was a man lingering near the garage but he was not Bob. In fact, I'd never seen him before. I decided to take my dogs and go outside to see who he was and what he wanted. He told me that he lived down the street and knew my husband. He was really friendly and began telling me all about how he had to move out of his house because he and his wife were divorcing. He seemed quite familiar with my husband and even asked about our dog, Pepper, who had passed away a few months prior. Pepper was a very smart and protective dog and could be scary if he thought harm would come to me or my family. He didn't realize that Pepper died and really seemed genuinely apologetic about it. Meanwhile, I noticed that my dog, Shadow, still hadn't settled down around this guy. He wouldn't let him pet him and the hair on the back of his neck was sticking straight up. He would intermittently growl during a conversation too. This was really odd for him and... I was pretty confused because this guy seemed really nice. After chatting for a while, he asked for my husband's number so that he could call him. And that was a red flag for me. Because if my husband wanted someone to have his number, he'd give it to them. So I told the man that I'd give him a call right then. I called my husband in front of the man who suddenly looked a little nervous. I explained to my husband that Jim from down the street was at our house to visit him. Immediately, my husband told me to tell Jim to get off our property and never return. This scared the crap out of me because, like I said, my husband is really friendly and hospitable usually. But he told me to make the man leave and he was on his way home. I ended up making some excuse to Jim... But for some reason, I just couldn't say something so mean to him after he'd been just so friendly and polite to me. And he backed up right away, suddenly quick to leave. My husband arrived home a short time later and explained that Jim was apparently a severe crack addict who had been stealing from all of his neighbor's garages. His wife threw him out because of this and he's been desperate for cash to support his habit. He was probably scoping out what he could steal from my husband's garage and seeing what obstacles my dogs would be in his way. He second-guessed it. But to think that he could have harmed me or my kids makes me furious. I mean, he seemed so nice and I felt like an idiot for not realizing the truth. But I've learned my lesson though. If somebody comes over that I don't know why my husband is out, I'll call him right away next time. So this started towards the end of my 8th grade year. Basically, my friend had this guy who was following her on Instagram and he would comment on all her posts telling her how pretty she is. Now, that wasn't super weird, but we found it kind of creepy because this dude was obviously in his late 50s and she was only 13. And then, he also started messaging her just about every day. Not anything overly creepy, but just mainly small talk at first. Eventually, he finds my page too and starts commenting, but I don't post pictures of myself online much, and basically, all of it was just doodles and pictures of my dog and stuff. Now, this guy's account also mainly consisted of art, and most of it was actually pretty good, so I didn't mind him commenting on my art at first. Eventually, though, he also started messaging me and trying to talk to me. I have pretty bad anxiety and I hate coming across as mean, so 
I wouldn't really respond with words unless he asked me a direct question. But mainly what I did was just send a heart or a smiley face. Stupid, I know. So, this continues for a few weeks and I learned that this guy can randomly blow up. I learned this because I had responded to a message from him asking my age and I told him that I was 13 and then put my phone down because I had to do the dishes or something. When I came back to my phone, I had like 10 messages from him asking why I wasn't responding and also telling me that he was joking. I was super confused at first at what he could have sent that for, what would have made me mad and basically he responded about how both me and my friend looked like we were 18. I found that really creepy, but I didn't want to confront him about it, so I told him that it was fine and that I was just doing my chores and the conversation moved on, and I made an excuse to stop messaging him for the day. But one really creepy thing that he did, though, was when I posted a picture of my grandma's dog, which is a corgi, and put it in the caption of how much I love that dog, he liked that photo, and then a day or so later, he sends me a picture of a corgi he drew for me. I thanked him for it, and then he asked me to tell him my address so that he could send it to me. I refused, but he kept asking me, telling me that it was a gift and he wanted me to have it. I had to send a message explaining that it was a family rule and that I was not allowed to tell him my address, and for him to just drop it. Eventually, after a bunch of little creepy things, my friend blocked him and so he started ranting about it to me, saying how she shouldn't be creeped out by him and he was just trying to be nice and that if she had a problem with anything he was saying, how she should have told him. He basically continued on like that for the next few days and then he pointed out how he was following her backup account and now he was going to start talking to her on that one. So... I just told my friend about all of this and she blocked him on her backup too. I stopped responding to him as well and blocked him, but man, who knew Instagram could be so creepy? For context, I'm a tiny 24-year-old woman and I live with my boyfriend in a very small apartment complex maybe 30 units in a pretty safe town. We've been there for almost two years, but this story takes place late October of 2017. Also important, my designated parking space is the farthest from the entrance to our complex, and it borders the back gravel lot, which is for visitors, or residents who don't have a designated space. My boyfriend parks there because we were only given one spot. So, the back lot is to the left of my space, and the space to the right of me is vacant or unassigned and has been for over a year now. A few months back, before this story takes place, a white van had periodically been parking in the vacant space to the right of me, but not consistently. They would usually park in the back lot or in one of the four marked visitor spaces. However, it had become increasingly frequent that they would park next to me. Although there were closer spots that were also as vacant as the one next to me. So, it was a Sunday I believe and I had just gotten home from getting my hair cut. I pulled into the parking lot and noticed a, a charcoal grey sedan with heavily tinted windows in that vacant spot next to mine. And the car was running. I found this odd because there were several designated and visitor spots open and I had never seen this car before. As I was pulling into my space, the grey car shut off. I'm naturally cautious and this seemed odd to me as well and I was listening to Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon and wanted to finish the song I was on so I waited a few minutes because I can't leave a good song unfinished but mostly because I felt anxious and I felt like I was being watched or something. I tried to reason with myself that they were just waiting for someone maybe and I know I have a tendency to be paranoid, but I still needed to collect myself before leaving my car. After the song, I turned off my car and hurried inside where my boyfriend was waiting for us to get ready to go meet his family for his brother's birthday outing. We were in our apartment for about 20 minutes while I changed clothes. We walked out to the gravel lot where this car was parked and 
I noticed that the charcoal grey car was no longer next to my car. It was now next to my boyfriend's car and it was running again. At this point, I mentioned to him how odd it was that they were still there and had moved to the visitor lot. We were out a few hours, but I didn't notice the car when we got back. The next day, I had off from work and I got in my car to go pick up some groceries and there was a, a note on my shield. I immediately began to shake because somehow as I grabbed it, I knew that it was from the people in that grey car. I was so panicked that I couldn't fully read what they wrote to me. I just started crying as a fear response and I have a panic disorder so thanks for the panic attack guys. I won't quote the entire thing because much of it was, well, really graphic. But here is what I will share. It read, Hi, you must not even remember us, but at approximately 5.32pm on the 29th of October, you pulled up next to us and although you appeared preoccupied or pensive, we couldn't help but share. We're serious about pleasing others and would be honoured to be the ones to train you. I'm 6'2", 175 pounds and 25 years old, and she's 5'7", 112 pounds and 22 years old. They also share incredibly detailed plans, which, mind you, I didn't ask for, and you can guess. I was able to compose myself and went to pick up my groceries, called my boyfriend and he came home for his lunch break, and we emailed our landlord. He went back to work and... I spent the rest of the day in shock and I just felt so violated. I mean, this is my home. This is supposed to be a safe place and these strangers violated that. I don't shame them for their kinks or whatever, but this is not the way to go about that. I mean, they came to my home. They painted a picture of me and them and I didn't even ask for it. I didn't even want it and they gave me a reason to be paranoid and afraid that they would make that disgusting picture a reality. It took a few days, but I did call the police eventually, and they came up to our apartment. I told my story, and they collected the note that was left, and I kept a daily journal and documented the contents of that note before they took it, and so I quoted the above as accurate word for word. They ended up calling the creeps, but I never heard back. Interestingly enough, though, I never saw that white van that used to occasionally park next to me after that and I was really surprised because I didn't expect the police to take this seriously at all because of some of the stories on here. I didn't expect the caring response they gave. My boss changed my schedule up so I'd get home when it was still light out and I called my friends or boyfriends every time I walked to and from my car for a few weeks. Anyway, this was a, a difficult story to share and I'm holding back on sharing the full extent of how I felt, but what I know is that it was strange that they were parked next to me with all the open spaces. It was strange that they turned their car off when I parked. It was strange that in the 20 minutes I was in my apartment, they were still in the lot but had moved spaces. It was strange that the car was still running. It was strange that the mysterious van stopped showing up after the police called the people in the grey car. It was all just strange. They left enough info though that I was able to look them up on Facebook and I had one mutual friend with the guy who was an old heroin junkie co-worker who I immediately blocked and unfriended. It's been a while since that incident but I'm still vigilant when walking up to our apartment because I get off work pretty late. I'm extra cautious of my surroundings and I trust myself when I feel that a situation isn't just quite right. But the most unnerving part, aside from their graphic plan, is still the fact that while I was composing myself in my car, they saw and they made it very known that they were watching me and they knew that I was uncomfortable. But man, am I glad that I sought help. I'm glad that I had a large support group and most importantly, I'm glad those creeps haven't tried to contact me since this. Anyway, thanks for listening guys.
This happened about six years ago, if I'm remembering the year correctly. I'm pretty sure I was 11 at the time, though. It was time for my first ever overnight stay at a summer camp, and I was pretty excited. This particular camp had a system where it normally functioned as a day camp, but there was one night each week where kids could have stayed overnight if they wanted to. I was a, a socially awkward kid at the time, so I avoided these overnight stays as much as possible, but this one time, I decided to try and be brave and have some fun and try it myself. Only after did I regret it. So, before I explain what happened, I'll briefly give an outline of the camp. It was situated near the shore of an isolated lake, which had very few houses on it. And my camping ground decided to take advantage of that and agreed to set up a few feet from the shore, in a small clearing located near a small path. Much of the shoreline was walled off by low-lying thorny underbrush, including the area that we were in too. So, flash forward to the night and we've set up our tents and sleeping bags and we've eaten our s'mores and we've set up our sleeping arrangements. I'm in a large tent with three other boys sitting a few feet from the path that ran through the clearing and we whisper amongst ourselves, talking about the best camping activities, crushes, the nicest counsellors, you know, usual summer camp stuff. We're just about to say our good nights when we hear the faint hum of a motor coming from the lake. It's unusual for people to be out late at night on a motorboat on a, a small isolated lake, but we initially blow it off as being some weird person fishing. However, the noise grows louder and I begin to hear what sounds like drunk people cackling. At first, this isn't scary to me. I just assume it's drunk people having some late night summer fun and my tent mates agree. We try to ignore it, but... We started getting nervous when the cackling and the chatter quieted. I hear the engine shut off and it sounds like the people were quietly disembarking at the camp's fishing dock, which was a few hundred feet away. For a couple of minutes after, I hear pretty much total silence and we were pretty terrified. The two of my tent mates are completely still while the other is fidgeting and shaking. But looking back on it, it wasn't even like this should have been especially scary, but something just felt distinctly off about the whole situation. And my gut instincts were right. I start hearing slow, methodical footsteps creeping slowly along the path. It's clear that this intruder is intent on being as quiet as possible, but it's easy to hear when someone's walking in a forest full of sticks, mud and leaves. I'm listening to their steps as they approach our campsite at a, a painfully slow pace when suddenly they stop and grunt. At this point, it's clear that one, it's a man, two, not a person who should be here, and three, someone who was watching us when we set up the campsite. There was no way that he could have known where we were without watching us from another part of the lake or something. The man stands for what feels like an eternity before he begins to move again. But the sounds I hear, they terrify me. He moves toward my tent. All my tent mates are laying completely still now, mortified but not moving a muscle. He approaches our tent, walking right up to it so that we can see the silhouette of his legs outlined by the faint moonlight. He stands for another few seconds and then places his finger on the tent, and he drags it across the tent, and then just begins to walk. The man traces the entire perimeter of the tent with one finger, and he holds it there for a few seconds after, then grunts again and slowly walks to another tent. My tent mates are terrified, and we're looking at each other like a deer in headlights. We hear him move from tent to tent, and walking around each one, with each trace feeling like it took longer than the last. Finally, he walks slowly back up the path, grunts once more and walks away quickly in the direction that he came. A few minutes later, I hear the motor on the boat starting up before hearing its sounds fade into the distance. The counsellors who slept through the ordeal, believe it or not, were convinced that we were faking the incident to prank them or something. 
those of us who reported it to them were pretty much ignored and that is something that I hold against that camp to this day. I still don't know what happened with the other people on the boat, where they went or why one of them came to our campsite in the first place, but man, that was a creepy night. First, I'd like to say that I'm a 15-year-old male with paranoia. I always carry a knife with me and get spooked pretty easy. I'm 175 pounds, 5 foot 7 and a power lifter. So, I was crossing Alabama into Mississippi when I had to take a shit. And my grandfather was driving me back to my dad's house in Jackson, Missouri. He pulled into a rest area and stretched his legs when I went to the bathroom. There was no security at the rest area and the bathroom was in the back of the building. The only person in there was at the urinal. I walked to the stall farthest from the door and as I walked by him, he turned around and started walking at me. His pants were unzipped at the urinal and he reaches into his pocket or something and I hear a flick, just like from an assisted opening knife. And that's when I realize what's in his hand. I froze for a second, grabbed my knife and saw the bathroom door open. Someone came in. The guy who was coming towards me put his hands in his pockets and he just left. This happened two weeks ago and the guy was white, bald, late thirties, maybe early forties. He had a black shirt with green cargo shorts and I'm yet to tell anyone about this. I am really grateful for that stranger to come in when he did and who knows what could have happened to me if he didn't. I didn't have anything of value on me so I seriously doubt that he was trying to mug me. Which means he wanted something else. So when I was around seven years old, we moved into a big house that was split into three different apartments. It was a light blue shade, so everyone called it the big blue house. I had a sister a year younger as well, and we lived in the upstairs apartment. There were two apartments on the ground floor, and in the front apartment lived a couple with their teenage son, and my parents knew them pretty well and had actually known them for most of their life, in fact. They lived in the apartment for a long time, but... The third apartment is where people seem to come and go. I still remember a certain tenant who was a lady in her 40s that had a daughter around the age of 4 years old. She would scream at her daughter that it wasn't her fault her father decided to go be with a whore. So, even at the age of 7, I knew that this was really odd to tell such a young kid that her father was like that. The little girl would even tell me sometimes that my dad is with that whore again. But this story is about the tenant who moved in after she left. So, he was just a single guy in his 40s as well and he was really friendly. Now, my mum was an addict and would take off for weeks at a time. My dad had to work full time to take care of us, so we were left alone a lot of the time. And if not with the teenage son of the couple who lived in the front apartment. He would babysit us sometimes, but half the time we took care of ourselves. I remember hanging out inside the apartment of the couple with the teenager pretty often. My parents loved them and they were good people and we hung out inside the apartment a lot. And sometimes when all of us kids and adults were there, they would invite the man next door to come over and hang out too. But this man carried a camera with him at all times and he loved taking our photos and since we were young girls, we loved having our photos taken. So he would take a ton of pictures of us in full view of the adults and tell us that he would print them and give them to us when they were ready. I don't recall this man ever asking us to enter his apartment or take photos alone, but he was overly friendly and seemed to enjoy taking our photos just a little too much. He would also photograph our older cousin, who was 16 years old at the time, and if I remember correctly, this lasted about a month for her. But the next thing I know, my dad is telling me to never go into that guy's apartment or speak to him at all. 
After listening in on the adults talk, I also find out that someone entered his apartment. I don't know if it was the landlord or a friend, but they discovered that he was developing our photos and cutting our faces from them and pasting them onto the bodies of naked girls. He had them plastered all over his walls, just seven-year-old girl faces on those bodies. He moved out within days of people finding out about this too, and I'll never forget hearing about that. Since I have no idea if the cops were called or what happened to the guy in the photos afterwards, I don't know what happened to him. So, I don't know if this creep may still have my child photographed somewhere. If anyone is interested, I can ask my dad and see if I can get more info, but I've never brought it up to him before, so I don't know how it'll go. A few years ago, I, a female, lived in my car. I was fresh out of college and overwhelmed with student debt, and being young, dumb, and 21, I thought car living was a good way to save money. I live in Southern California, so the rent is high and the weather is temperate enough to make this possible year-round. One night, I decided to park in a neighborhood that I thought I knew well. It was right by the beach and a couple of blocks next to an ex-boyfriend's of mine, so I felt safe there as I had walked the streets at night plenty of times. I parked, locked the doors, hung up the curtains so that no one could look in plugged in my earplugs so the cars passing wouldn't wake me and fell asleep pretty quickly. Now, my earplugs were effective but shitty, and I could always count on them falling off in the middle of the night. I actually preferred this because it meant that I could fall asleep but still hear my phone alarm in the morning. It was about 2am when I woke up to my earplugs already having fallen off and something feeling wrong. Odd scratching noises were coming from my window. It started at the passenger side door and then moved to the back seat doors. I froze, unsure of what to make of it all, painfully aware that I leave my window slightly cracked at night for ventilation. I honestly didn't know what to do, so I just stayed frozen trying to make sense of it all. And that's when the flashlight turned on and some guy, I mistakenly shone his light in, trying to find a crack in the curtains. And to my horror, he found one and shone it right where my face was. It's hard to explain, but the position of my head made it so that I could piece together what was happening, based on the light everywhere, but he couldn't see my eyes. And the scratching then continued, and I knew that I was screwed. This went from a potential attempted car theft to someone knowing that I was in the car. But by the way, I had up those psychedelic curtains at the time. Very eye-catching and hard to miss. Stupid, I know. I got black curtains immediately after this incident. This is why I suspect that he knew that I was in the car the whole time. He just put two and two together. Also, I don't know for sure, but the scratching noises... They sounded like he was trying to shove something into the cracks of my window and grab my door lock, but failing to gain any traction because they were barely cracked. Anyway, during those times, I slept with a bat and mace by my seat, but I was literally paralyzed with fear and couldn't will myself to grab them. However, my last year of college, I took a class called RAD and remembered the number one rule yell confidently and confrontationally at this person. I wish that I could say that I screamed something badass, but what left my lips was a loud, aggravated and forceful, excuse me, like I was Link yelling at the Princess of Hyrule in that shitty TV show. It was super lame, but it echoed. To my immense relief, I hear the sounds of his footsteps running away at top speed, but I kid you not... This guy was laughing as he ran like it was some stupid game. I was still paralyzed, but eventually him running gave me the courage to get up, grab my bat and shove my way to the front seat where I started the car and just sped away. I didn't see him and I spent the night at a friend's house and I live in an apartment now. 
It wasn't until the next morning that I realized I had parked one block away from a bar and at the time of the incident, the bar had just closed. 